Hey, good afternoon, everybody. We're going to start in just a minute. <clears throat> My name is uh, Mike Morneau. I'm with Learning Times. I'll be your producer today, and it's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to draw your attention to a couple of things. Uh, one, you'll see that um, there is closed captioning in place for this, uh, this webinar. If you do not see it, you can click the CC Live Transcripts button at the bottom of your screen and select Show Subtitles. If you wish to hide them, simply turn them off by clicking the CC Live, Trans Live Transcript Hide Subtitles. Uh, you'll also see at the bottom of the screen are two opportunities for you to interact. One of them is the chat window. The other one is the Q&A. We will ask if you could please submit questions for our presenter today via the Q&A box. And if you have any just general comments or if you want to tell us where you're coming from, use the chat window. Uh, I'm joining you from just outside of Toronto, Ontario, where it is very cold by my standards, but anyway, uh, probably colder for some of you. And I spoke to somebody yesterday in Minnesota who was having an absolutely frigid time, and so I felt better. But anyway, hopefully you're all uh, keeping warm wherever you are. So without uh, further delay, if you have any questions for, um, uh, or, sorry, any questions uh, with regards to the Zoom platform, please feel free to let me know in the chat. I'll help you out and we'll pass things off to our host, Robin bauer Kilgo. Robin, go ahead. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our C2C Care webinar, Basis, Basics of NAGPRA. Um, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that this webinar is being moderated on the traditional lands of the Miccosukee and Seminole people and their ancestors, and I pay my respect to elders both past and present. Um, well, again, welcome. This is another one of our C2C Care free webinars. Um, we're happy to have you join us. Please go ahead. Everyone's using the chat wonderfully, saying hello from the locations they're at, which I appreciate. Um, I'm beaming in from the Florida Keys, so at this time of year I try not to talk about weather because for us it's actually really nice out right now. I'm going to go through a couple of quick introductory slides and then I'm going to hand this over to our presenter, which we're very excited to have today. So give me just one second. Well, again, we are here for Basics of NAGPRA. We're going to be running this program from 1 to 2.30 Eastern. My name is, again, Robin bauer Kilgo. I am the C2C Care Coordinator, and you just saw Mike Marno. He's our Senior Producer at Learning Times. If at any time you have any questions about the platform or anything else, please go ahead and put them in the chat, and we'll give an answer to you as quickly as we can. This is our home on the web. If you have um, are joining us for the first time, it is connecting to collections.org. I encourage you to go check it out for archives of all of our past programming. We have a lot of programming, so I encourage you to go check that out. We also have our courses listed there, our course archive, which are slightly different. Um, our courses are a little bit more in-depth, but after a year of it being a paid program, you can actually access the content for free. So I encourage you to go there as well. We also have a link to our community. Our community is a moderated platform where you can go and ask questions of uh, professionals to get answers when it comes to collections care and, and preventative co collections or conservation. So again, I encourage you to go check that out as well. We also have curated resources on my website. So again, go there. You can find all sorts of fun resources on all sorts of projects or things related to the collections world. So again, encourage you to go check it out when you can. Currently, um, we have one C2C Care webinar on the books coming up in April. There's a lot more in the works. We're probably having another one. We try to do one a month. So there's one happening in March that's almost ready to be launched. So again, go to our website. You'll find information on it there probably next week. In April, we are definitely doing one on collections intake in a remote work environment, um, which is a nice long title. But basically, as the past couple of years have shown us, we now work from home mainly. So uh, we have a presenter talking about a bunch of different things that we've dealt with come to virtual signatures, come to looking at collections as they come to us, um, mainly through a virtual setting now. So again, I encourage you to sign up for that webinar. It should be really interesting to kind of hear of some of the technologies folks are dealing with. We also have some upcoming programming being scheduled for the annual May Day, uh, I guess, celebration that FAIC and AIC have every year where we really focus on emergency and disaster planning. So again, go to our website and you'll be able to sign up for those webinars for free. 
We have two places where you can find information for us in social media as well. We have our Twitter feed and our Facebook page. Announcements for all upcoming programming can be found there. As Mike said, as attendees to this program, you have two ways to interact with us. One is via the chat box and one is via the Q&A box. Chat boxes for technical questions, general comments, folks saying hello, which you guys are doing wonderfully at per usual. Q&A box is for questions. We will have a Q&A period at the end of the presentation. Um, I do encourage you to use that Q&A box for questions. So if you have a question at any moment, put it in there and we'll track it at that point. I'll also note that we are recording this webinar and um, there's certain resources in a presentation that are gonna be available for you on our website after it's done as well. So I'm gonna stop our share and see about handing this over to our speaker today. Our speaker today is Eric Hemingway from the Anishab Ottawa Tribes. He is Director, Department of Repatriation, Archives and Records, Little Traverse Bands of Ottawa Indians. He has worked in the Tribal Archives for 16 years and has extensive experience under NAGPRA. Whenever you're ready, Eric, you're more than welcome to take over the presentation and we will see you at the end of the Q&A. Thanks and go right ahead. All right. Well, I'd like to say thank you, uh, miigwech. It's thank you in my native language of Anishinaabemowin. I'd like to give a tradi traditional introduction of who I am. It helps get me centered, uh, helps my train of thought and any type of engagement talks that I give. Uh, so um, I apologize for any mistakes I make in advance. I'm still trying to learn my native language day by day, word by word. Ganebek and Diznikas, Anamatikamek, Waganak Singh, Ndonjiba, Anishinaabe, Odawa, Endau, and Jijek Dodem, Jinnigay, Archives and Records for the Waganak Singh, Odawa, and Gichianda, Mapi, the Man Oki, Manda, Minobamata Ziwan, Minwa, and Jinnikians, Mapagijigat. So, one of my native names is the snake. Uh, my, my English name is Eric Hemingway. I self identify as an Anishinaabe Odawa. I am from the place of the prayer tree, uh, AKA Cross Village, Michigan, that's in the land of Waganuxing, is basically Emmett County, Northern Michigan. And I am the director of archives and records for the Little Traverse Bay Bands of Odawa Indians one of 12 federally recognized tribes here in the state of Michigan. And I'm very happy to be here to share my, my work and my life that have now intersected completely at this point and to share a little bit about NAGPRA. And for a little bit about my experience with NAGPRA, I was um, doing NAGPRA exclusively for about eight years of my work here at Little Travers. I no longer do NAGPRA officially for the tribe or any tribes at this point. I've kind of stepped into uh, a training role, a helper role in helping museums and institutions understand NAGPRA. Uh, but for about seven to eight years, uh, that's all I did was repatriation. And when I first stepped into this role, I had no idea what repatriation, I had a clue what repatriation was, but I didn't know what NAGPRA was until my boss said one day, um, we're gonna hand this duty off to you. I just started my job. So I just knew nothing about it. Um, but I you know, did my research very quickly and found out what it was. And it just was a no brainer that you know, we work to have our ancestors returned and, and sacred objects uh, returned as well. So a lot of my, well, all of my experience has been through doing the, the work. So I, in my trainings, I share a lot of stories um, that I've accumulated over the last 16 years of doing the work. Um, and plus, you know, some of the experiences that help build the foundation for doing the work I'll be sharing with you uh, this afternoon. But with repatriation, it's, it's a very important and ongoing, um, I don't wanna say chore, but it's a task. It's a, it's a sacred duty for a lot of tribes to do this. And you know it comes in a lot of different forms. So we'll look at that. But I wanna say miigwech to uh, everybody for taking the time to be here. It's always humbling to uh, be, you know, in front of people um, sharing, especially in this day and age when we're, you know, sitting in front of screens and devices all the time. So, pe so for people to take even more time to, to be sitting in, you know, a chair in front of a computer is very humbling to me. So we'll get right into it, NAGPRA. So NAGPRA is a federal law. It is a federal law that was passed in 1990. And in my mind, the Native American Grace Protection Repatri Repatriation Act is an extension of the 1978 Indian Religious Freedom Act. So Native people had to have a federal law passed late in the 20th century 
to ensure that their constitutional human and civil rights are honored in the terms of religious and spiritual practice. No other race has a law that pertains strictly to their religion like natives do. So in 1978, it was finally um, passed, but there was a lot of oppression and a lot of damage done up until that point with natives not being able to fully practice their religion, their traditions, their spirituality. But also during this time period, a lot of ancestral remains were taken out of the ground and put into museums and federal agencies and private repositories and, and, and the like. So uh, we needed you know, the Indian Religious Freedom Act to express and practice and carry out our beliefs, but it needed to go one step further in my mind. And that was with NAGPRA where we had to have the ancestors come back and a large component of a lot of native beliefs are the ancestors. They all differ in some regards. No, no one tribe is the same as the other tribe. And that's a, a thing I wanna get out there right away that we're not this homogeneous people. We're not all Indians. Uh, we're all sovereign independent tribes and nations and communities who have different languages, beliefs, customs, um, interactions with our environments. So that's something that needs to be addressed immediately because I've gone into consultations with museums who had never talked with a native person, had never dealt with a native person, and they're drawn upon their preconceived notions of what a native is. You know, a lot of times from pop culture and movies and media, and we have to just start breaking that you know, misconception down immediately that we are Anishinaabe, we're Odawa, these are our beliefs, this is where we're from. Um, so that's one of the starting points. But the, the dead, the, the ancestors is something that transcends a lot of different tribal communities, but how they interact with their ancestors is unique to them. So you have to take that into account when you have these, I don't want to call them collections, I always call them you know, ancestors or you know, these people, if you have them in your collection, that they have to be dealt with individually. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Uh, so NAGPRA is this law, it's passed in 1990, and it's very specific in what it applies to. So it applies to ancestral Native American human remains, and it's this broader term called cultural items. And under this term, it's um, sacred objects, objects of cultural patrimony, um, associated funerary objects, and unassociated funerary objects. So we'll get into what those are in more detail later, but we're just going to go through the basics. So what are our objectives? What is NAGPRA? Who is it applied to? Um, what are some of the basics? And why was NAGPRA created? So this is just the, the nitty gritty, I call it. If you wanna look you know, up what the law is and what the regulations say, I mean, I always encourage anybody to do, to do this. When I was um, practicing NAG for full time, I always had a copy of the law and regulations right on my desk so I could refer to those. And I would highlight certain sections um, that I would, was more um, you know, in rhythm with at the time, and especially with human remains. That was a, a large priority um, for the tribe that I was working for at the time doing this was get the ancestors back first. And then we'll concentrate on sacred items and, and object items of object of cultural patrimony to me with which are very close. But again, this is what the tribe I was working with, the priority for them. This could differ from tribe to tribe. But it seems like across the board um, that return of ancestral human remains was the priority. And NAGPRA applies to any institution that has received federal funding. So it can be a municipality, it can be, of course, a state, it can be a university, a museum, um, a township. A, you know, if you've received federal funds, and you know, it could be a one-time basis, a grant to fix a roof or a road, or you know, some funding for for scholarships, whatever, um, you apply as a museum under NAGPRA. So it was very diverse in what type of you know, organization or group you're gonna work with. It wasn't always the, the atypical museum or university. We worked a lot with um, cities. You know, they would be going through and doing road construction and doing water main maintenance and so on and so forth. And they would find individuals, uh, you know, maybe just one individual, it'd be a mass burial. And then once they take control and possession of those ancestral remains, then they become a museum and have to comply with the law. And there's some things they're gonna to have to go through that we'll talk about. Um, the Smithsonian does not uh, fall under NAGPRA. They have their own set of rules and regulations that is just specific to the Smithsonian. 
So uh, Natural History and the uh, National Museum of the American Indian, they have their own separate repatriation law that you can um, look up. And MAG, NAGPRA is multifaceted. It's property law, civil rights, human rights, and but it's also Indian law. And this is something that's very specific for, for tribal communities and tribal nations. These laws, whether it's uh, you know, Indian Child Welfare Act, Indian Religious Freedom Act, um, you know, Citizenship Act. So natives have a lot of legislation that applies to them more so than any other population in the United States. So this is a long line of federal legislation that is applied towards native individuals, but it's just more recent. And it's also a little bit more um, diverse in terms of, of where, where it can go into, you know, such as a city, a museum, uh, or a federal agency. So NAGPRA addresses tribes, and it also addresses Native Hawaiian organizations, NHOs, and they're, they operate differently um, than, than tribes in the, in the lower 48. And it also applies to, of course, um, communities in Alaska, which operate a little bit differently. Um, but also it touches on religion, science, land history, and the relationship of native communities with the federal government. All of this falls under NAGPRA. So it's a pretty dynamic piece of legislation. So who does NAGPRA apply to? Like you said, anybody who has received federal funding. Um, when I first started uh, doing repatriation work, uh, one of the first tasks I had to perform and execute was, who are the museums in my state? You know, I, I'm focusing on Michigan. And who does this apply to? And so once I figured out, you know, how, how this works under the law, it could be a city, it could be, you know, a, a local organization. Um, it started to reach out to these different institutions that have received federal funding. And uh, how I knew that they had federal funding or were a museum under NAGPRA is that under the regulations, if you are a museum under NAGPRA, you have to submit an inventory of all the native human remains you have in your collection and that inventory is uploaded to the National NAGPRA website. So you go to the National NAGPRA website, you go to the inventories and summaries databases, and you can browse by state or institution. So I went to the state of Michigan and all of the museums who submitted inventories were listed. And it, said, it had the data of how many individuals they had. Um, and if we knew the provenience in any um, funerary objects. But the big number uh, was what we call MNI, minimum number of individuals. They had to know exactly how many individuals that were in their control. And so when they found this out, they would have to upload. It's part of being in compliance with the law. So these institutions, these museums would upload these inventories into the National Niagara website. So I go in, I go to Michigan, and then there's just dozens of institutions um, that had submitted these because that's what they're supposed to do under the law. So from that point on, I would just contact those institutions and say, you know, I got your information from the, the database. I know you have these individuals. And so what, let's go to the next step. You know, let's, let's go through consultation because it is our desire to have these individuals returned and reburied. So some of the institutions I worked with immediately were these smaller museums. Sometimes they'd have a staff of two or three a budget of next to nothing. And they got in compliance immediately and as soon as they could. You know, some of these institutions got their inventories in, you know, in 1992, 93, 94. Um, some didn't at all. It just kind of fell through the cracks. And so they had to submit their inventories much later. But long story short, we would start in these discussions um, about, you know, what repatriation is. And but before I started to get into the nitty gritty of the law, you know, I would explain to this, this museum why it's important for the tribe. You know, why are we here in these conversations? And we would explain that to the Odawa, uh, caretaking for the dead is one of our longest and most steadfast traditions. You know, that we have what we call um, a ghost supper to this very day, or jibai supper. Jibai is our native word for spirit of the dead. Um, in historic records, it's called the, the feast of the dead. And we still have these ghost suppers to this very day um, in our communities. And I grew up with these ghost suppers in my home, um, going to other homes of Odawa in Northern Michigan as a very young child, some of my earliest memories. So these experiences became part of the consultation. You know, I would talk about you know, going to these suppers and feeding our ancestors and it's more than a memorial. It's a, we're actually having a connection to our dead and we're keeping them fed and prosperous and they return you know, that to us when we take care of them. And so this you know, retrieving 
repatriation and reburial is an extension of that caretaking for the dead. It's something we never did before. You know, we never had to go in and you know claim ancestors that were taken out of the ground. It's, it's something that just did not happen, but now it has. So we've adjusted you know, our beliefs to go and get them and bring them back. So that's really you know, some of the basis for you know, why this is important. I think that's very, very important if you're stepping into these you know, conversations and consultations with tribal nations to let them express that if they feel comfortable doing so. But this really helped accelerate the process when we were able to have these conversations in a safe place, um, preferably face-to-face -face consultation. We would explain why we're doing this, uh, the importance of it. And once we had you know, that conversation or conversations, uh, the process seemed to go pretty well. You know, they, they under, the museums understood what was going on and we started to look at the details of the law but I wanted to bring forth, you know, the, the culture, traditions, beliefs, just at the same time as the law, because in, in our minds, they were equal. You know, we needed the law to, to accomplish this, but this was also important in our community. This is why we're doing it. So it's very important to have this, these conversations during consultation. So again, who does this apply to? It applies to um, any museum that's received funding, all federal agencies across the board, no matter if you're the Department of Defense, the Army, the Marines, uh, the Bureau of Land Management, National Forest, you know, if you're a federal agency, you have to comply. And they have some of the largest collections. They have very large collections, especially out west, I've seen with some of the Bureau of Land um, collections, you know, they cover literally millions of acres. Um, so it just depends on your state and your area. Um, you know, in Michigan, we don't have a very you know, large presence of, of federal land management. There's some, some national parks and so on and so forth, but it's not like out west. And so it really varies from state to state, area to area. Again, it applies to all tribes, um, applies to Native Hawaiian organizations, um, Alaskan corporations, but also applies to what we call a lineal descendant. And this is an individual who can trace an unbroken kinship to an individual or an item. So um, lineal descendant claims actually are the strongest under the law. They'll actually override a, a tribal claim. And the lineal descendant, I mean, it doesn't have to be you know, a member of a federally recognized tribe. They just have to show that they have an unbroken connection documented to an individual and or funerary objects or sacred objects. So they're a little bit rare, actually quite a bit. Uh, but they do occur. So these, this is where a NAGPRA applies. And NAGPRA also covers a lot of land and it, it applies to all federal and tribal lands uh, across the board. So whether it's, you know, and tribal land also includes um, within the boundaries of a reservation. So reservations are different from tribe to tribe, or nation to nation, they're not all the same. And I mean, that's just something I wanna get out right away that, Everything is unique to each individual tribe, especially when it comes to land. Uh, like for instance, you know, east of the Mississippi, we don't have the, the real large uh, reservations like west of the Mississippi and Wyoming and Arizona and New Mexico. Um, they're, they're very different, but they're still there. And when, as NAGPRA applies, it applies to within the, the established boundaries of a reservation. So if those boundaries are established, it's the land within those boundaries that can be whether it's private, state, um, tribal, you know, if it's within that established boundary, NAGPRA applies. And so it applies to all trust lands, it applies to all federal lands. And again, this is more um, of an issue out West because of the huge amounts of federal land. So if there's you know, an invert discovery of human remains or cultural objects, you know, that agency you know, should have some type of pro protocol in place where they contact, you know, the set tribes who have Aboriginal ties, history to that area, and they go through the process of consultation, what to do next, and so on and so forth. Um, again, not every tribe has a reservation. Um, not every tribe has what we call you know, a defined reservation boundary. So you have to really know your Indian country. And Indian country is a term that's like law, culture, populations, news pertaining to tribes. So if you're a museum in a certain state, you know, it, it really behooves you to look at, you know, what tribes are around you and what is, what, what is their status? Do they have federal recognition? Do they have reservations? 
you know, you know, who are their contacts? Do, you know, where's their home base at and so on and forth, so on and so forth. So when the time comes to carry out the consultation, you know, you know who you're dealing with and you have, a, you know, at least a basic idea of, of their, their standing. So, and this can vary from tribe to tribe and, and, and just within a state. Um, so again, if you're interacting with one tribe, that doesn't mean that that same experience, resources, et cetera, apply to all these other tribes within your state. And again, I also encourage, you know, look at each state has its own burial and antiquities laws. Some are stronger than others. Um, like for example, here in Michigan, um, it's not so strong. Uh, we've gone through um, some cases here in Northern Michigan where, you know, we've had private landowners who have, you know, put in a foundation or a pole barn and they discovered burials. And under the law here in Michigan currently, you know, whatever is found on private property belongs to the property owner. So they can do whatever they want with these individuals. Um, so we've tried to work out, you know, some type of awareness to the general public here that, you know, the tribe takes repatriation very seriously under the law, but, it's, you know, when the law doesn't apply, we still can repatriate. So, you know, when we were doing this work, I should say when I was doing this work, we would, you know, engage in the media a little bit and do some articles and just let people know that, this is something the tribes do. And, you know, the public was pretty interested about this, you know, that the tribe would go through and say, wow, you know, they're, they got this whole department and, and staff and there's this federal law that, you know, says we're going to go and, you know, we, you know, get our ancestors back. And this is, you know, something that transcends a lot of human beliefs that, you know, you know, caretaking for the dead. And doing this, individuals were coming to us, you know, and said, hey, you know, we were doing this work and we, we found this. And they would bring them to a, my office and, you know, and say, hey, you know, we, we know this is a resource now. Um, you know, we want you to do the right thing. So we would, you know, of course, take them and, and rebury them in the fashion that we were taught. And so it's became, it still goes on, you know, that, you know, people are finding individuals or, you know, we've gotten um, contacts from people. And, and one of these scenarios, this woman called me and she goes, I, I want to talk to you. I see you do this work. And, um, can we meet somewhere, but make, you know, not nowhere too public, you know, she suggested we meet behind the grocery store. And, but um, a little bit later, like eight o'clock at night, it was in the summer. And I was like, this kind of sounds kind of shady, but uh, you know, I, I gotta see what's going on with it. She said she really wanted to give, give us something. So I, you know, I go in and go behind the store and there's this, of course, it's a white van, no windows. And I'm like, great, this is, <laughs> this isn't going so well. And uh, they flash the lights and I knew it was an individual. And, this, you know, little old lady gets out and, and she says, you know, I want to give this to you. And I'm pretty shamed about this, that, um, you know, my father passed and we were going through his estate and we found this and it was a box of human remains. And he was a quote unquote amateur archaeologist. And he was digging around the area when he was a young man and, and taking out individuals and he kept them. But inside the box, you know, he had handwritten notes, you know, Ottawa burial, so-and-so and so we knew, you know, it was our people. And so we took the individuals and this is, you know, NAGPRA didn't apply whatsoever because NAGPRA, NAGPRA doesn't apply to private collections or international collections. But we use NAGPRA as sort of a, a way to open the door, a segue into this broader, you know, work of repatriation. So we got these individuals back and, and reburied them. So this still goes on. So this is really the spirit of the law that you can open up the conversations even broader. Something that is really important with, with NAGPRA is control and possession. So these are two very important legal terms and that you have to have control, legal control of the remains or items in order to carry out the law. Now, just because you have physical possession doesn't mean you have legal say over those items or individuals. So a lot of times things will get loaned to different institutions, museums, federal agencies, and man, did we see this trade of items go on a lot in the early 20th century where we would contact one museum and they say, well, you know, in 1940, this item was loaned to another museum from here. And it was kind of a wink and a handshake and a nod. There was hardly any paperwork. And we'd go to that museum and say, oh yeah, we have this item. But then this item was loaned in return. So it's become, you know, it was a real struggle at times to figure out exactly who had control who could 
you know, legally repatriate the items back. So just because you have possession, you have it in your physical custody, doesn't mean you have the legal say to go and do this. And so it's really important to have, you know, that information in line immediately is like, what is ours and what isn't? If we have things on loan, you know, where's the loan agreement? Where's the paperwork saying that this other institution has control and we have only merely possession? That, that's absolutely critical. Uh, you can't go forward, you know, under the law without having that established uh, from the get-go. Uh, so thankfully, you know, most of the institutions I dealt with, they, they had a pretty good idea of who had control and who had possession, but loans were very common. And in one instance, we were dealing with a, a federal agency and it was for human remains. And we were going through the process. I contacted them. They said, yes, we have some of the remains that's listed on the inventory. I said, well, you, what do you mean you have some of them? I'm like, well, the other half of the collection of remains is at this other museum. So I contacted the museum, like, yes, we have this other collection, but we don't have control, we just have possession. It's on loan from the agency. So I contacted the agency back, say, oh, no, no, they have control, we only have possession, we're just holding them for the museum. So there wasn't a lot of communication going on. I don't think there's been communication going on concerning this collection for decades. So it took years for, the situation to finally resolve and say that the agency had control. They had the legal say. And when that happened, the remains went from the museum back to the agency. And we went through the repatriation process. We put in a claim for the remains. Uh, it was a joint claim with multiple tribes because we shared this um, ancestral territory with different tribes. We put a joint claim in and the remains were returned to the tribes. And at the end of the day, we were able to go back and rebury almost exactly to where the remains originally came from within the park. So that's possible. If you have a situation where you have you know, federal land, I really strongly urge you know, to, to explore that option because reburial for tribes isn't, isn't always set. A lot of tribes don't have you know, land to where they, you know, secure land where they can rebury. And so sometimes tribes explore the option of reburying on federal lands, especially if they can get it close to where the individuals are from. That's a goal of a lot of tribes. So we were able to actually rebury within actual feet where the, where the remains were, which is pretty rare. Uh, but we had to get that settled first of who had control and who had possession. So some key terms that we wanna look at real quickly. We looked at, you know, what, you know, museum um, and with tribe, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a pretty broad term. And there is a, you know, there's what we have in the United States, we have federally recognized tribes and not federally recognized. And this is a, um, a slippery slope at times. And I'm not gonna get into who's a tribe and who's not, um, but under the law, there is a hierarchy. And, it, you know, the federally recognized tribes are the tribes that have preference first. And then, but it's not to say that non-federally recognized uh, can't operate under the law, they can. Um, so there's different avenues where non-federally recognized tribe can go in and repatriate. Uh, many times they have to be in cooperation with the locally federally recognized tribe. But if there is no locally federal, federally recognized tribe, then the non-federally recognized tribe can go in and execute repatriations. Uh, sometimes they have to go before the review committee to do this, the, the National NAGPRA Review Committee. Uh, sometimes they don't. So I, I don't want to say that it's always federally recognized. That, that's not the case. Uh, federal agency is pretty self-explanatory. You talked about lineal descendants. Um, Native Hawaiian organizations are out in, obviously in Hawaii, and they have different relationships with the federal government. They don't have treaties um, like the lower 48 do. They don't have reservations like the lower 48 do. So it's a very different dynamic in Hawaii. So if you have collections from Hawaii, you have um, these NHOs, and I believe there's over 200 of these NHOs. So there's quite a bit. Um, so you have to go in and just really immerse yourself into Hawaii. It's, it's not like here in the lower 48. So sacred objects. Sacred objects are one of the, the key items that fall under NAGPRA. And this is something that I work a lot with smaller institutions. 
um, when I was doing NAGPRA full time in the sense that they were, so inventories apply to human remains and associated funerary objects with those remains. It's very straightforward. I would encourage you if you have human remains, you know, complete your inventory of course, or update it. But also um, when we're working with smaller institutions who had human remains, that you have an osteologist or some type of forensic anthropologist go through because a lot of times we're finding um, animals that were buried with people. And so they had to go through and say, okay, this is an otter bone or a bear bone or whatever. And that would become an associated funerary object to that burial. Because a lot of, you know, they were just commingled. They would literally put this animal on top of the individual as part of, you know, the burial. So we had to go through and it changed the number of the inventory, the minimum number of individuals, but then it changed the number for you know, your funerary objects. So if you don't have that really dialed down, I really encourage you to, to go through and do that work. But then consulting with museums, you know, what is a sacred object? And that became the million dollar question a lot of times because you know, sacred objects vary from, from tribe to tribe, individu individual to individual. So a lot of times we'd have to just go through and just kind of walk through the collections with museum staff as part of the consultation and just pull drawers open and look. And I would give my, my opinion of what is sacred and what isn't based on my experiences, you know, being Anishinaabe, growing up in the culture and the heritage and traditions, and also you know, from my historical knowledge. And this is my opinion. You know, every, you know, you can bring other native individuals to consult with, they may have different opinions, that's fine. But we go through and look, and there's some things that really stand out for our tribe. And this usually applies to other tribes like eagle feathers, hawk feathers, um, drums, pipes made out of um, pipe stone or catlinite. It's a red stone that's found in Minnesota. A lot of tribes use this pipe in ceremonies. Um, so those are, you know, things that are kind of, I call the low hanging fruit. You know, we see eagle feathers, that's a sacred object. We use these in a lot of different ways. Um, but then there was other things that are more specific to the Odawa, you know, certain rattles, certain types of drums, um, certain types of, of carvings. And they would just label these as dowels. Like, no, that's, that's an effigy. That's something that was used in a certain type of ceremony. So this item that was flying under the radar as a dowel now all of a sudden becomes a sacred object. So you really have to bring in, you know, tribal individuals, tribal experts, and have them look at your collections because it is so varied. It could be simple little rocks, you know, from your archaeology collection, but a lot of rocks are used in ceremonies for different tribes. And I've seen rocks used in ceremonies. So I would know, you know, very specific types of rocks. I would see these and I was like, that, that's used in a ceremony. You know, I've seen the ceremony per, firsthand. And so again, that shifts from one collection to, an, into the sacred objects. And through the process, you know, we would determine on our end, and again, this is just from our perspective, do we pursue this item or not? Um, I've talked to some other tribal individuals you know, who, who don't pursue the objects immediately because they're not ready to have the objects come back in their communities. So you may be going through the process and have an object labeled as a sacred object and the tribes don't put in a claim. Um, that's at the discretion of the tribe. And there's a lot of discussion and consultation within the tribal communities that has to go on first, whether we can manage it, who can use it, uh, so on and so forth. And a lot of times these sacred objects have to be brought back and put to rest. So who's gonna do that? How's it gonna go down? And so on and so forth. Um, so when doing the consultation with sacred objects, I mean, just, I really encourage you to have an open slate, you know, very open mind on this. And also that, you know, tribes have gone through quite, quite a bit of change in the last 300 years. I mean, there's been a lot of traditions that have been lost. Individuals have gone who carry that knowledge. And it's really unfair to come in and think that these tribal individuals are gonna know everything. Um, that's just not the case. You know, there's been concentrated efforts to eliminate tribal culture, language, religion for the last 300 years. And one of these um, vehicles for this forced assimilation is Indian boarding schools. So this has been in the news quite a bit lately. Um, in Canada last year, they found 
literally hundreds of children buried around what they call residential schools. It's the same as our boarding schools, same institution, you know, government run um, institutions of forest assimilation. So I brought up this whole painful history that most tribes know about, you know, they know about these boarding schools. There's over 360 of these schools in the United States. So that's part of this legacy, this very dark legacy of loss of knowledge and culture. And tribes are piecing it together. Some, some tribes have more you know, tradition and cultural knowledge than other tribes. Um, but it's very unfair to expect that tribes know all of this stuff right from the get-go, as soon as they come in. Um, so I've seen this happen in some consultations, um, and other times I haven't. So I just wanna put that out there that you know, tribes may have had this item taken out of their community over 100, 200 years ago, and it never came back. So you have to find people who have pieces of this information and have to consult amongst themselves with these sacred objects. And not, you know, all these items are always used for a positive manner. And there was a museum here, actually it was a city in Michigan. And it's one of the last consultations I did uh, for the tribe here. And they just received a large collection from a private donor. So these individuals, especially during the early 20th century, they were buying, they were taking, they were thieving. I mean, they were just accumulating all this stuff. And this guy just had this, you know, thousands of items and he donated it to the city right before he died. And the city said, oh, we, we have this stuff. What do we do with it? And, you know, one of, their, one of their lawyers said, I think some of this stuff applies to NAGPRA. We had to talk to tribal nations about this. And we were going through the collection and they just had just the stunning items. You know, they had ghost dance shirts from out west and they had this wedding dress from, um, I think it was a, a Cheyenne where it just had all these, um, um, elk molars, and it was just stunning. And I was like, you know, I don't know anything about this. I think it's culturally relative to the tribes. You have to contact them. But then we got to a few items that said, you know, Ottawa, and it had, you know, little pouches and, and some of the descriptions of this, you know, what we call medicine. And medicine is a very broad term in Indian country to, to apply to a lot of different things. Um, but how they, we're phrasing the term medicine wasn't in the most positive way. And I think it had some hair in there. And so I was like, we don't, we're not ready to engage with this yet. You know, this may, may be a negative type of thing, but it's still a sacred thing. So we were working with the museum and said, for this item, we asked that, you know, it's off limits, that people don't touch it, um, that be wrapped in certain colors, cloth, and that we provide other medicines to be housed with it. Um, and those would be cedar and sweet grass and some other things. Um, sort of balance it out. So this may be something that you may engage with with a, a tribe when you're talking about these sacred objects that they may ask you, can you, you know, have these cultural protocols in place um, while they're here uh, before we pick them up? And so you, I've been to uh, you know, a lot of museums where they have a, a long list next to a box and, you know, do this, do this, don't do this, don't do this. And so it's really, really um, you know, gratifying to see that the the museum was honoring those, those beliefs. That's, again, the spirit of the law. They didn't have to do this for these sacred objects. And some of these sacred objects, we also um, you know, have to know about contamination, that if there was something used on this item to preserve it, especially in like the 30s, 40s, and 50s, arsenic, lead, you know, these really harsh chemicals, especially the, you know, real fragile organics like feathers. Um, if I see a feather that's in pristine shape, that's shiny from 1920, I'm not going to touch it. You know, we got to get this thing tested. Um, stones and metal, not so much, but the leathers and the feathers, things of that nature, if they're really, really good shape and got that sheen, that, that's, those are some red flags. So we encourage you, if you have items, to get them tested at some point and, you know, make sure that they're not just safe for the tribal people, but for your staff as well. And so that's one of the first things we have to establish. Is this thing even safe to handle um, for us and for you? So something that we worked quite a bit with on smaller museums was grants. And so I know, you know, from experience working with some smaller museums, you know, times are tight, they're always tight at museums. So, you know, what can we do to help, you know, financially to get this done? And grants were a great way. I mean, there was, there's several types of grants. Um, repatriation grants actually go and physically do the repatriation. Uh, the tribe can apply for it, or the museum can, or we work together. We work together with museums on several dis different repatriation grants. 
And it, it funded just that for, for me to go out and retrieve the individuals. And then there was these larger documentation consultation grants up to 90,000. And this really helps with the you know, smaller institutions who are struggling to get their inventories completed, their summaries completed, because you have to complete a summary of all the sacred objects that you have, or you think you have, and submit that to National NAGPRA. So to you know, carry out all these consultations and have you know, staff to do this can be pretty taxing. So these grants definitely help offset that. So definitely worth exploring. You just go to the National NAGPRA website and go under their grants. They have a, a grants compliance officer. This is you know, what this individual does. And the repatriation grants are on a first come first serve basis. So you, you know, at the beginning of the fiscal cycle for the, for the feds, you know, get your, your grant in. There's requirements that you have to meet. Um, but the consultation documentation grants are competitive. So you know, having you know, strong letters of support and a, you know, a game plan you know, really goes a long way with these um, competitive grants. And like I said, we've utilized these multiple times to go and mainly get ancestors. I, if we didn't feel, didn't feel too good about flying with remains, it just didn't, didn't settle well. Like if you can't carry them on with you, then they'd have to be checked. And I don't wanna, I don't wanna do that. We didn't wanna do that. So some of the remains that we had to go and, and, and get were as far, far away as Nebraska. That's the farthest I've had to go personally to get remains. And this was during this depression era, uh, buy and sell time of human remains. It was a commodity that individuals were going across the country and, and looting you know, native graves and, and selling them to collectors, museums and the like. So it was a little bit, um, let's say, Shocking and disturbing, not a little bit, quite a bit, to, you know, see these ledgers, these receipt books. Um, but they were, you know, this was the roadmap that we had to use to, to get these individuals back because in the receipt book, the ledger would say, you know, native, six native skulls um, from this county in Michigan sold to so-and-so on this date for five bucks per person. And so we were able to use that ledger to say, you know, this individual or these individuals are from Michigan this county, this county has very you know, strong historic ties to the Odawa. Therefore, as the Odawa today, we're here to claim our ancestors. So it became part of the evidence. Um, but in this one case, we utilized a repatriation grant to go out and get the, the individuals from Nebraska. And I, you know, we rented a car, I was by myself, and I just didn't realize how far Nebraska was from Michigan at the time. It was quite the haul, but and I went out in, I think, late April, early May, tornado season. It wasn't the best time to go, that's for sure. Uh, sirens, some wicked thunderstorms. Uh, but got to the museum and, you know, all the paperwork and telephone calls and emails resulted in that moment of, of physical transfer. And uh, the staff, you know, you know, lady was just excellent to work with the whole time you know, brought them out and they were ancient. They were pre-contact individuals, you know, you know, between 1,000 and 2,000 years old. And she asked, you know, how are you so sure that somebody that's 2,000 years old is related to you? And immediately, you know, I go back to that time when I was a child at these ghost suppers. And we're talking about the ancestors. The ancestors have always been here and we're our Anishinaabe people. And this is our original home, the Great Lakes, Michigan. And so, you know, relating that in the consultation that, you know, this is just part of our, our tradition, you know, our beliefs. And it's all passed down orally and it's also practiced through our, through our ceremonies. And she said, I just, just had to ask, you know, and you, you know, you went through all this trouble to get these six men and, and take them back home. And it was really sobering because at the time I was in my early thirties and they went through the work and said, these are six men who were in their early thirties. So it was a real, sobering um, realization these are you know, this was me in a sense and so we um packed them up and then she went a step further and said you know we have all these funerary objects these, you know these carvings were found with the individuals and at the time she didn't have to give those back um because they were classified as culturally unidentifiable and this is a term that a lot of tribes disagree with and we were saying they're not culturally identifiable they are identifiable as anishinaabe people but this is a scientific term that's been used to label these, what we call it, you know, pre-contact. I don't want to say prehistory, I and mean, we had history before contact, you know, these pre-contact individuals. But as the law sits, even to this day, 
uh, funerary objects, associated funerary objects from culturally identifiable individuals don't have to be returned as part of the repatriation. But the lady said, this is just the right thing to do. You know, they, they came here with them, they should go back with them. And they were some of the most amazing things I've ever seen. There were these carvings on shells of different spirits. Um, and a lot of these spirits, I, I rec you know, I, I've seen these designs in other places and it just reinforced, you know, this continuity of tradition and belief. Something 2000 years old that has the same design as something, you know, a rock painting from 400 years ago in the Great Lakes. So brought them back and it was, a, it was a different road trip for me, you know, having all these individuals. And I got to my first stop. I couldn't drive all the way back in one day. It was, it was impossible. And so I got, you know, do I bring all these, you know, these, these men in with me to my hotel room or not? Um, of course I did. It would be disrespectful to leave them in a car locked. They've been locked up for you know, a century. So I brought them in. I didn't sleep too good that night. You know, I was just a little bit nervous, but the second night I slept fine and then immediately reburied them um, when we got back home. So it was just a real journey, but I thought about the journey for those individuals. You know, it'd been over a hundred years, you know, that they've been on this journey and we were able to bring them back. We weren't able to bring them to the exact spot where they're from. It's a parking lot now. It's, you know, it's not the same, but at least we were able to get them back on the ground and it fits into our, our traditions as Anishinaabe people of taking care of our dead, which is something that a lot of native nations across North America believe in. So I know we're running a little bit short on time. Um, something else that is a key part of the, the NAGPRA program is the NAGPRA Review Committee. Um, I sat on this committee myself for four years. And when you have disputes, um, you go before the NAGPRA Review Committee to have those disputes heard. It's advisory, um, it's not legally binding in any way. But I, Hopefully, when things somewhat get back to normal and things are in person, um, I encourage you to go to a NAC review committee because you see that the process play out, not just with disputes, but people come and they're given presentations about updates. But it's also a really, really fantastic way of networking and seeing, you know, who's doing the work. Um, you know, if you have to consult with a tribe or NHO, you know, a lot of times you can meet them at these review committee meetings and have an impromptu consultation. Um, so, um, when hopefully things get back to somewhat normal, I really encourage you to, to go to one of these meetings. And a very key part of NAGPRA is the federal register process. This is laid out in um, the regs, it's in the law, it's on the website. So I won't take up too much time in going into this, but you have to publish a federal register notice as part of a, a repatriation. You just can't give something back. Uh, one of the consultations I was having with an individual he goes, oh, yeah, we got this skull. I'll send it to you FedEx. I'm like, no, no, don't send anything FedEx. We got to go through a process. You got to publish a notice. And if the skull applies to our tribe, we'll come down and, and retrieve it. He goes, okay, yeah, whatever you, whatever you want to do. I was like, I like the enthusiasm, but no, no FedEx. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll handle this a different way. Through the consultation, we, we you know, found that, that that individual wasn't even from Michigan. It was an error in the record. So but you have to go through and publish a federal register, federal register notice for any repatriation of human remains, sacred objects, or objects of cultural patrimony. But the federal register notice is also a great source of information because it's a, a snapshot of an individual repatriation. So if you need to find a contact at a tribe, you need to find a contact in a museum or federal agency, um, I would just peruse a federal register. And, and that's a really great way to start because those are usually the most up-to-date contacts. So finding contacts at tribes can be can be difficult. I'm not going to lie. Uh, each tribe is different. They have a, you know different levels of of resources. Um, but I encourage you to you know just go and see what tribes are in your state if they're at all. And also, you can't forget the removed tribes out in Oklahoma, Kansas. Um, this they get looked over quite a bit, uh, but they are still part of the process. So if you're from like Kentucky or Tennessee, Georgia, and you know these. You know, the Southeast where there's a lot of removal, but there's a lot of removal in Indiana, Ohio. Um, so there's a Northern removal. There's some tribes removed out West. So I would look, you know, who are the historic tribes in your state? And if you can't find any, you got to look at, you know, Oklahoma, Kansas. Um, but also in Wisconsin, there's some removed tribes up there as well, the Oneida and Stockbridge Muncie. Um, so don't forget to remove tribes in the process. There are over 40 tribes in Oklahoma alone. And I believe the vast majority of those tribes aren't from Oklahoma. I mean, you got Kansas. So you got to engage with them as well through 
the NAGPRA process. But I'll end this before we get to our questions on human remains. Human remains seem to be the priority for a lot of tribes and the regulations changed um, in 2010, uh, before pre-2010, any individual that was labeled culturally unidentifiable did not have to be returned under the law. There was a process for them to go back, but that change in 2010 where it said all human remains have to be repatriated under the law, whether they're culturally unidentifiable or not. And that process is laid out in the new, in the regulations of, in 2010, it's 10.11. Um, so if you have human remains, you have to repatriate them if you are an institution that falls under NAGPRA. And with that, Robin, um, that brings me right to my 45 minutes, I believe, or hour, and we'll jump into some questions. That was wonderful. Thank you. I'm actually putting a quick note in the chat because we have questions popping into both the chat and the Q&A. So I'll just remind everyone that if you can try to put the questions in the Q&A because it's a little more, it's a little easier just to track them while we're doing it. Um, and actually, before we get into questions, one of our participants noted that the um, IAIA archives in Santa Fe is about to release the finding aid for the Susan Schoen Harjo papers, which contains numerous files about her work on crafting the language of the NAGPRA Act. So if you really want to do a deep dive, I would say keep an eye on that and <laughs> see if you can see how the act was created and crafted. So. All right, so let's start with some questions. Um, is NAGPRA applicable to institutions that received federal funding before, but not after, the act was passed? No specific instance in mind. She's just curious. Absolutely. Yeah, I think almost all the institutions I worked with received their funding pre-1990, like, mm -hmm. like University of Michigan. <laughs> you know, they, they got some funding a long time ago. Um, so yeah, for sure. And from my understanding, it is just like if you receive federal funding, like it was a real flat, like just if you get it, you know what I mean? Like that's the thing you're looking for. Um, do U.S. territories such as the U.S. Virgin Islands fall under NAGPRA or do they have another set of policies and laws? That's a good question. That is a good question. I don't believe so. I don't think territories, it, it's not applicable to territories. I, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Should be, I in my mind, it, it should apply to territories. On yeah. all my years of doing this, I'd never seen anything from the territories. Yeah, that's it. Because they even pointed out that the National Park Service is on St. John's. So they receive federal money. So it would be interesting to follow up on that at some point from what someone, or if anyone in the community knows, feel free to put it in the chat. But that is an interesting place to go look at or get some clarification on. Um, just want to clarify whether NAGPRA applies to museums that receive federal funds or any institution, non-museums, that receive federal funds. Any institution. So I've dealt with cities, I've dealt with states, I've dealt with state police, I've dealt with mom and pop museums, I've dealt with, you know, you know the um, field in, in Chicago. I mean, if you read, it doesn't matter if you receive federal funds in your museum. Perfect. Um, someone asked, can you talk about the consultation process? After tribes are invited to consult, what does the process look like, especially for consultation related to human remains? How much of that process is driven by how the tribes want to proceed versus a process the museum might establish? This is the definition of, of compromise, you know, of, of meeting both ways. And it's all individual and what you know, what tribe you're working with. Um, so I would just start by having some very honest and open conversations, um, understanding what the law states. And also at the end of the day, these individuals have to go back. After, after 2010, they have to go back. So understanding that at some point, these individuals will go back to the appropriate tribe or individual. But um, in-person consultations is the best for this. It's very sensitive, um, have, have patience, um, have grace, um, and try to understand, you know, this longer history I consider of taking. You know, there's the taking of land, ancestors, traditions, children. It's, it's a part of a bigger picture um, of colonization. So, and realizing that, you know, you might have tribes who, have, you know, might be angry, they might be frustrated, and that's, that's understandable. Um, but, you know, have patience and, and have 
um, a mutual, you know, a neutral place to meet at first. You know, always bring in the museum or always bring them to museum is a can be seen as a show of a force or, or you know, a show of power. Like you're always on our terms, you're always in our place. Pick a neutral place and have a meal. I mean, the, I mean, food goes a long ways. You know, it's a sign of of uh, caretaking and respect. So maybe you have a, a neutral place. You have a nice meal. You talk, um, and have it over and over. It's not a one and done type of thing. It just takes time. And for some of the larger repatriations I worked on, where it was over you know 100 individuals, we met dozens of times because the museum was going through all of their bureaucracy. You know, their CEO, their board, their staff, they're coming in with all these different tribal people. It took years, but we, we got it done the right way. It wasn't rushed. And then um, when it was all said and done, we had a relationship built and we went further. And with this one museum, we're still working with them on exhibits, on professional developments. We're working with them on presentations all the time but it was built on that you know respectful work that we did with ancestors but now it's like we're doing the fun stuff in my mind like exhibits i mean that's that's mm -hmm. but we had to get the tough stuff done first i think you said some really key points there one was that uh meeting initially on a neutral ground i think is a super good idea because you're right like just walking in and being like here's everything like that that would shock anyone right just walking into a somewhat sterile museum experience and just being like, here it is, what do you want us to do with it? Like that's shocking. So you definitely want to treat it, you know, calmly and lightly. The length of the process, my, the folks I know who have gone through it, it takes a long time. So I think that's a, a truly good point about that. Um, this person went on to ask kind of what cultural sensitivity should museums should be aware of in terms of dealing with consultation related to human remains. That again, those points that you said of just taking your time, really talking, slowly introducing the concept. I, I do also want to point out, and you mentioned this earlier, which I really liked, was that there's no universal cultural attitude towards this. You are dealing with so many different people and so many different tribal communities and everything that it's it, that's going to fluctuate a little bit, I think, when it, you start really getting into the nuts and bolts of of dealing with these. What, like, can you talk a little bit more to that a little bit of just, you know, what, what's the best way to approach it for first baby steps, you think? Um, it's like even beyond baby steps, it's like crawling. <laughs> you just yeah. gotta go super slow because each, each tribe is different. I can't stress that enough. We're, we're not all the same. And I've gone to some, some larger museums and they just had a whole, this is what can be intimidating. You go to a museum and there's a whole room full of people, mm -hmm. boxes and boxes of remains. It's overwhelming. You know, it, it can be heartbreaking. It can be sad. You know, and one of the largest repatriations I, I did, it was about 60 individuals. And the, the day came where we went and retrieved them. And I say we, as me, myself and I, and I went down to the museum and got the, the remains and they were just all stacked outside of this museum in boxes and I was conditioned for that. You know, I've been going through the work for a while, but if you're not, it can be pretty overwhelming. And so knowing that tribes have this different idea about them, a lot of times that they're, they're animate, they're alive. They're not collections, they're not specimens, that they're ancestors. And very rarely do, do tribes, you know, use the term you know, artifacts to, to describe people. It's the ancestors. So there's this, there's this connection but then there's also different beliefs. Like I've gone to some museums, they said, Eric, we, we, we published a federal register notice. We want to repatriate these people back to their, their tribe, but they won't come get them. I go, that's their tribe's discretion. I can't talk on their behalf, you know, they'll, they'll beat me up. You know, it's like, no, that's their thing. And just from my, my very, you know, broad knowledge, you know, that tribe, isn't into bringing people back. Mm -hmm. You know, once they go out of the ground, that's it. And that's their belief. Maybe at some point things will change, but that's their belief. And they, the, the museum was say, well, we had these for years. We, we wanna do this. I'm like, well, you gotta do what the tribe does. You gotta follow their lead because that's part of their belief. This is religious, this is spiritual. 
And sometimes, like I said, tribes don't have land. They want to do it, but where are you going to rebury? And we, we still have problems, Robin, with diggers, you know, people who go out and dig stuff up. So yep. our, our place is secret. I, I can't tell anybody. It's in the middle of nowhere. Um, so we still have that issue of, of security. But just realizing that every tribe is different. But then some tribes have protocols they wish for you to, to enact while you have them. Like certain people don't touch your remains. Usually nobody. They're wrapped in certain cloths, certain colors. Um, there's certain, you know, people will come in and interact with them. So that's something you could ask as, you know, museum staff, like what, what, what can we do to make this better? Yeah, I think it's to me, it really boils down to just respect. You know what I mean? It's just respect and kindness is kind of what, what you really have to ask yourself just how, you know, it goes down. I remember when I first was learning about all this back in the nineties, when I first did my undergrad in anthropology. And to me, I just kept thinking, you know, like it's just respect and trying to honor what either the beliefs of people or, or groups want, you know what I mean? Is really what you're boiling down to. And your point about how, you know, there are, some communities who might not want the objects back right away, but if you can provide them a sense of, of care and, and respectfulness that you're caring for these things the way they want to be, that's just as you as the museum person puts you in a better place, I think, just generally speaking. So I really appreciate you bringing that all that up. I'm going to go back to questions because they're still, they're still rolling in, which is not surprising. Right. Um, so let's go on to you talked a bit about pesticides on collections, which is something I, I also have a, a soft spot for. Um, someone asked, what do, you, what do you do once you know there are pesticides present on something that is sacred and or will come back to your community? So what are your thoughts on like, if you are able to identify something, what should you do to help the community or help the group? Well, I, if, first off, you know, identifying wild sites at the museum, we, and I'm just speaking on my personal belief behalf. I'm not mm -hmm. speaking on behalf of all tribes, um, not to bring that back to the community. Because mm -hmm. ideally, you know, tribes are going to want to use this, or at least people will touch it or interact with it. Mm -hmm. So they'll bring elders in or you know, spiritual leaders to, to at least touch it. And if it's got arsenic and things like this, I mean, people get sick pretty quick. Um, so I would have these things tested immediately. You know, and if they are diagnosed with having these higher levels of contaminations, then it's on the responsibility of the museum to properly store these. So I've gone to, you know, museums and they have these like, industrial bags, essentially, these really thick bags that are, you know, and it has a biohazard symbol right on the bag and it says contaminated. And so they have it way in the corner, you know, away from usually in a, you know, some type of box or container and say, well, this is, this is, you know, been labeled as contaminated. So um, the tribes don't want it back. Um, we don't want to touch it. So it's kind of a holding pattern to figure out how you can clean it. Right. So that's like the next phase. Right. Um, I also like, hey, you, you're absolutely right. Where if it looks good and it's from the 1930s, don't mess with it. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm always just like, don't mess with it. <laughs> like, there is something on there that kept that thing nice looking. So like, I, yeah, I'm of the same opinion. There are a few questions in the Q&A that people are asking for specific uh, geographic locations where they live. I'm going to recommend, we might hit those eventually, but for a lot of those, I'm going to really say, if you can go, we have a resource sheet online that lists some resources on where to figure out where your, like your local geographical tribes are, right? So I'm going to really recommend that you guys go access those and then start the communications with those groups. Because as we've been saying, Eric is not representing all people right now. So you really need to talk to them to make sure that things are happening. But that's, I just want to clarify that while I'm looking through some of these questions. Um, someone says, someone sent me a news article that suggested that the NAGPRA laws were changing again. Have you heard anything about the laws, about them being adjusted or changing anytime soon? Yeah. I mean, I, one of my colleagues, because I'm, I'm not practicing the law right mm -hmm. now. So I'm a little bit out of the loop. Um, so I need to get more in the loop. I'm doing the trainings. But um, yeah, I believe there is some talk of amending the regulations and um, I'll have to do my homework, but there's been a lot of talk um, since 10.11 was passed about the unassociated funerary object or the funerary objects with CUI. So I um, imagine that would be part of the conversation. 
someone asks, um, any recommendations on how to locate a forensic anthropologist to identify fragments and remains? What is the proper way to go through with this, especially with culturally unidentifiable remains? That's a good question. You might have, especially, you know, with these local, with our smaller institutions, sometimes you get a shoebox full of stuff, right? And it's like, okay, how do I even start that first process of trying to uh, recognize these? Um, there's consultants and, you know, I, I would look at uh, your local university first and foremost and see, you know, if they have any type of staff or departments that would specialize this or your state, you know, they have, usually have a list of consultants who do this, like whether it's archaeology or forensic anthropology, um, because, you know, state police will find a person or a sheriff. And sometimes they just kind of farm that work out to different individuals because they don't have enough staff to do it. So I look at, you know, your, your state governments um, and your universities. And this is really important. We had one repatriation where it was a trunk full of people and with just all these bones commingled. Just, it was just a mess. They just dumped them in this, literally this trunk from the 1800s. It was pretty creepy because it was in this basement. There was a trunk. And I was like, this, this isn't cool, you know? And But you're going through and it's just like, how many are in here? And like, we, well, we think it's this number. It's like, you can't think you got to get your, your MNI pretty nailed down. So they, they hired somebody, I think they actually got a grant, you know, they got one of those documentation grants. And lo and behold, there was 10 natives, um, three Caucasian and, you know, four African American. It's like, it was all, everybody was put together and the number changed. And then at the end of the day, um, the museum said, well, can you take the other individuals and, and rebury them? That NAGPRA doesn't apply to them. I'm like, of course, that's, the humane thing to do. They, we're not going to leave them. Nobody's going to claim them. So we took them and we buried them. It was no big deal, but it, it changed the whole number, changed everything. Interesting. But like, yeah, and like I know I've come across situations like that myself, so it's not that unusual. Um, someone says, so the process of consultation is where, how we can find out if the items we have in our collection are required legally to be repatriated. Is that correct? So is consultation the first place to start? It is. It, it's, it's, the first, it's written right into the law multiple times that you have to consult with tribes. And, and part of the consultation process is not just um, acknowledging tribal oral traditions, but also recognizing that they are equal line of evidence compared to Western knowledge. So this is one of the only federal laws that says that tribal oral traditions heritage is equal with Western evidence. And so when tribes are coming in and telling these stories and giving their family histories, that's part of the evidence. That's, you know, it's not just a story. It's, this is somebody's dissertation. It's their life. You know, it's a, their expertise and their knowledge. Um, so you have to go through the consultation process. And the consultation isn't just, okay, I sent a letter. You know, it's engagement. It's a conversation. And the tribes are the experts on what's sacred. It's bar none, you know, they're going to tell you this object is sacred, this one isn't. Uh, some things, like I said, are pretty, pretty obvious, like eagle feathers. Eagle feathers are a big one. Hawk feathers, owl feathers, raven, um, pipe. But there's certain specific things, like, um, they're, oh, what's the Apache? I think the Kachina dolls. They're very specific to that tribe. We don't use Kachina at all. That's them. That's 100% them, not us at all. So you got to, and each tribe is different, especially by regions, like the, the plains and the Southwest and the Arctic and the Great Lakes, you know, they all use different things. A lot of it is in relation to their environment. You know, we're not using ivory, you know, that's Arctic tribes, you know, and, and we're not using sandstone, that's the Southwest. So, you know, the environment plays a big role in this. And so you just have to really figure out who you're talking to. I can't express that enough. Yeah. Well, and the other thing I'll say is that I really like that other point you did earlier in the conversation where you said that, you know, this could be the first step of a lifelong relationship with these communities that could result in so much more fun stuff, like what you were saying. Like we, we've done other programming where we've talked about how to build these relationships. And like, this is kind of a, a sad early step, but at the same time, it's a good step because it's returning things that should be back with the communities they belong to. And then you're forming these relationships to do programming and all the stuff that we want to, to bring to our public. So I think that's an important point to, you know, 
a, an excellent benefit to this whole process as well. And it's not just a benefit to the, the tribes, but a lot of the museum staff we worked with, you know, one of the big repatriations we did, you know, the, our main contact through the whole process, she's like, this was one of the best things I've ever done ever personally and professionally, you know, it just, you just, you can't explain it once you go through it, you know, you'll never do it again, hopefully, you know, once you do it, it's like done. Yeah. <laughs> Unless you go in a basement and find something else, which happens all the time. So I, I don't begrudge a museum that says, hey, Eric, you know, um, we went in a room we haven't been in in 10 years and guess what we found? Yeah. It, this happens constantly. And one of these scenarios we had, it was really bizarre. This guy, he was a professor at a university. He got wind that, you know, the university had to comply with NAGPRA. And he literally started to take remains out of the university's lab and hide them. Oof. And he was trying to transport them to his private lab. And the police had to intervene and threatened yeah. to arrest him. But he had written all this work on this collection. He had, you know, dug the remains up himself. He was so invested in it. He couldn't fathom them going back to be reburied. Wow. So the, and sometimes it gets extreme on the other end. Yeah. I mean, it is, it, you know, it's interesting. Like I said, I started my, my professional career in anthropology in the 90s when NAGPRA was still like brand new, right? And so there was a little bit of that resentment in the university circles, you know what I mean? Of, oh man, we got to do these, you know what I mean? Like it was this upsetness to it. But as I've followed in the museum field now for the past 15, 20 years almost now, um, and I, I have left out where I started working at a tribal museum. So like we were on the receiving end of it and it was more like, I saw this huge beneficial part of it. Like you said, like this great positive experience. And I think that that's, that's an important part to really think about as, as people approach it. Um, someone says, since the compliance for applying to a consultation grant is to have an inventory of human remains and associated funerary objects. Can you give more detail on the definition of associated and unassociated funerary objects? So associated funerary objects are the, the objects that are with the remains. They are literally with them in the collections. So unassociated is a known burial object, but there's no remains to go with it. Mm -hmm. So for example, we have gotten back quite a few unassociated funerary objects because we look through the summaries, you know, we, we request summaries from these museums and they send these summaries and they list, you know, unassociated funerary object because when it came into their care, their possession control, it, you know, it says this like kettle, Ottawa grave. And there was a, a market for this that people would go through and, you know, either take the people or the objects and sell them. Now, a lot of times these objects were just, either disassociated from the remains or the remains were sold to somewhere else. But the fact remains that that's from a burial, but it's unassociated with a current set of remains. Someone just said, do AFOs include faunal and animal remains? Yes. Yeah. And so do unassociated. Mm -hmm. Now this gets tricky because, you know, if, if you have a bunch of like bear skulls or teeth are those from a burial? It could be. People were buried with these. You can't rule it out. Um, someone asks, as someone who's getting training to work in the conservation of historical items, I wonder how NAGPRO would affect conservation. What does a tribe do if repatriated pieces come back and they have been conserved in either an insensitive, dangerous, or non-traditional method? How should concert conservators and restorers go about conserving items? How should they go about contacting people to determine the steps to take regarding conservation? Well, I mean, I would just, you know, start right from the very beginning of, of reaching out to the tribes first and then having that relationship because there's going to be questions as you go along. And then also realizing that once an item is repatriated, you know, the tribe or individual takes full control of that item. So what they do with it after the repatriation has occurred is no longer the, the concern or the museum's completely out of the process. I've seen this happen a few times because the museum was like, what are you going to do with this and how are you going to take care of it? Um, that's not their concern. You know, so there might be some little bit of rub because some items might have to be buried or burned. They've, they've you know, gone through their, their 
their life cycle essentially. And having them not go through that ending process is detrimental. So it all depends on the tribe and just having conversations. Um, is there a time frame going back into the history that NAGPRA covers, Paleo-American Clovis? So is there like a beginning date too? In, in my mind, no. You know, and I, I, I get into these terms quite a bit. You know, I, that, these are Western terms. You know, paleo, archaic, late woodland, early woodland. Um, in my mind, in, in my world, you know, these are all Anishinaabe. Mm -hmm. They're just old. They're old Anishinaabe. So no, I've, we've repatriated individuals that are thousands of years old and it was never ever this half step like, oh, they're really old, should we do this? No, it's absolutely has to get done. Um, so it's, it's really surreal to hold somebody that's 3000 years old, you know, from your homelands, very sobering. And, you know, one of these repatriations we did, we got the individual back and it was in January. And I was like, man, I don't want to have this sit in my office, you know, for five months because the ground's frozen. So I, I got all got all riled up and I put my snowshoes on and headed out in the woods with my shovel. And I was like, I'll, I'll make a fire and thaw the ground out if need be. This person has to go back. So I was digging and it was a miracle the ground was unfrozen. <laughs> so I was like, okay, I don't have to sit out here for five hours and, and you know tend a bonfire, but you know, you do it. So those, those, Titles, those labels, no. Kind of connected to it, this next question. It says, in cases where broad ranging collectors donated their collections, likely containing cultural objects, often but not always 19th or early 20th century, where do you start if accession information is missing or unhelpful? Do you even know what tribe to start with? So this kind of connects where, you know, a lot of people will come across things, they'll be like, these are human. <laughs> like we know that, like, let's say we figured that out. But then we're like, what would be, I mean, I, I guess I would start with probably a, try to get a forensic anthropologist or someone, because sometimes there, there can be some generic, okay, this is a white person, this is a, you know, whatever, they can get the, the basic ideas down. But do you have any other thoughts on that? Yeah, this is a, a pretty common issue. And, you know, I would, under the law, there's we, what we call them, the, it's preponderance of evidence. Mm -hmm. That's the standard that you have to show about 51% in favor of. So it's not like it has to be definitive that this is you know, affiliated to this tribe or this individual. You just have to have that 51% standard um, established. So you look at all the different things that you know, associate with the museum, you know, the location of the museum. If it's in a certain state, it's most likely to collect from that state unless you're like this huge museum that takes everything from everywhere. But you look at where you're at and then who are the tribes around you? And then what is the collection history of the museum? And then if you have known you know, individuals who have interacted with, with the museum over time, you know, what is their collection history? Is it Midwest? Is it Southwest? Were they all over and just, can't, just happened to come here? And usually these collectors kept some, some decent records because they were selling, they were bartering. Um, so I would look at that and then bring in your tribal individuals. You know, if there are items that will have certain patterns or colors, you know, these all can be pieces to help, you know, tell the story. So that's, it's, but some of these, it's, it's almost impossible. Like, you know, they have no records, nothing. And they fall under this category of, of human remains called um, unknown or Z unknown. And there's literally thousands of these individuals across the country. Uh, but under the process of 10.11, there, there is a process for them to be returned and reburied. So they don't have to sit forever. Right. Um, two kind of rapid fire questions. Does NAGPRA apply to 501c3 foundations that receive federal grants? I'm gonna guess yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes, okay. Does NAGPRA apply to institutions that received COVID relief money? It's federal funding. I got, yeah, that's a new one. I haven't, I, I would assume if, if it's federal money, I don't think there's any caveats or, you know, asterisk to say, you know, no. Yeah. I mean, I, I would think, think so. that if the COVID money came from the federal government, right? Because some it's people a, might have gotten COVID money from state, you know what I mean? Or other groups, but if, if it's, it's federal. If it's, if it's federal mm -hmm. relief, yeah. That's interesting. 
that's something I didn't consider either. Yeah, that's a new thing. Yeah. But I mean, it falls in line with all of, you know, other federal funding. I, I would say, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, someone says, could you please explain what is considered non-identifiable objects? Does that term only apply to pre-contact era objects? Um, I, I wouldn't say, no, it doesn't apply just to pre-contact. I mean, a lot of pre-contact items are identifiable. Um, so again, this, this goes into your consultation with your tribes and they'll tell you, you know, what, what these items are. And a lot of times items will, will simply be utilitarian. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a tool, like a basket or an ax. Um, so again, this, get, this gets into individual tribal consultation. I can't stress that enough. Um, during my time of doing repatriation, you know, I, I was part of 30 success, over 30 successful repatriations. And the, the secret sauce is consultation, mm -hmm. that we, we were having these conversations. Yeah. This is interesting. If a tribe decides not to pursue repatriation of an item, um, and it says a sacred object or, cult or object of cultural patrimony, after consultation, do they retain the right under NAGPRA to pursue repatriation at a later time? So let's see. Yeah. yeah. Now it's different if they, if a federal register notice is published and that item is affiliated to that tribe, then they can come and get that item at any time. And no other tribe can come in and take that item. But if the federal register notice is not published, that leaves that window open. There are a couple questions in here about um, paper records. Like people are asking about associated photographs or even archival records that are kind of connected to this world. I, I don't know. I don't really think they're connected, are they? Because they're not objects or how, do you know anything about that? Oh yeah, I've, I've never, I've had this brought up a few times. Photos definitely could, hmm. if it's a burial, if it's part of, you know, this whole burial ritual or ceremony. Um, but records, I mean, this could, I mean, with songs and ceremonies, I don't know. It, it depends on the tribe and what they deem as sacred. Um, one of the tribes I, you know, talked with years ago in the Great Lakes here, um, one of their first big repatriations was a Bible. I was like, interesting, but it was like literally like three feet by two. It was a giant Bible that they carried from the East Coast, you know, multiple states over hundreds of years and had all this family history and all this stuff, like a Bible. And, but they deemed it sacred and they, they got it back. So it's up to the tribe. Yeah. And I'm going to say a lot of these questions are people asking, you know, again, they're saying like, well, what about in this case and in this case? And again, we sound like a broken record a little bit, but it is going to be really up to the, the tribe that you're talking to in that consultation process is going to have to be the one that answers that. Um, yep. Really going to be up to them. I mean, I think of it, and this is me as like, you know, I'm high, I'm a mutt from Europe, um, but like it's basically, you know, I was raised Catholic, so there were very definite things that my father wanted when he was you know, uh, when he passed away. And so we followed them because we followed the Catholic traditions of what he wanted, right? But, you know, other relatives in our family have done something very different because they don't follow a religion. So it's just, it's up to that group and what they want to do. So um, let me see what else. We have three minutes left. So I'm gonna see if I can get a couple more questions in. Um, I'm also gonna say that we'll grab, I'll grab all these questions and pass them along to Eric as well because you can grab them from the Zoom reports just so you all know. And you got my contact mm -hmm. info, Robin. So yes. if people want to continue further conversation, that's fine. Yeah, great. Um, do you have any suggestions for discussing with indigenous communities the inability to repatriate objects that are not NAGPRA related? For example, made for sale ethnographic basketry donated by specific individuals. Oh, that's a tough one. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, you just have to build that relationship with whoever owns them. And, and this could take time. I, you know, I've seen this loosen up a little bit with collectors where they'll start returning things. Um, but you just really have to have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with that person or, or family to, to get this stuff back. Um, do more recently created objects fit into NAGPRA? For example, modern kachina dolls, feathers, or other sacred objects? Depends on the tribe, <laughs> you know. 
Um, I, sacred items are always being made. You know, uh, pipes are being made right as we speak. Somebody's at, you know, Pipestone mine, or not right now, but they will be this summer, you know, mining pipe, Pipestone to make pipes that are sacred. Um, you know, somebody will get an eagle feather that fell, you know, a lot of times uh, as tribal people, we have to put in applications to get eagle feathers, um, you know, from a, a national park or so on and so forth. And people put in, you know, a request, not a permit, a request to get eagle feathers. Um, and they get the feather and it's, you know, it's, it's sacred right then and there. So new, new things, absolutely. Um, this will probably be our last question, but before I do that, I will note that someone says CARES money does trigger compliance with 1013. So someone put that in the chat. Um, what are some differences associated with repatriations for an individual of lineal descent versus repatriation to a tribe, which sounds more common? Tribes is definitely more common. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the lineal descent is just that it's the strongest claim and you're dealing with one individual, not an entire tribe. Now that person could be part of a tribe, obviously. And a lot, I think they can work with the tribe, you know, to have the tribe be the mechanism. But at any time, if they have that unbroken documented line to that person or object, um, they have the first, first crack at it. Well, it is 2.30 on the dot. So uh, we've gotten through a lot of questions. There's a, there's quite a few questions still left, but like I said, a lot of them, which I'll go through and pass along to Eric for sure, but a lot of them are going to be, unfortunately, contact your local tribe and talk to them just to see kind of what they want to have. Um, I want to say a huge thanks to you, Eric. Thank you for covering the subject. You did it in a nice way that really spoke to these groups, and I loved all the personal examples. We're getting lots of thank yous in the chat right now. So thank you again. Do you have any final thoughts or words you'd like to pass along? No, just uh, thank you, Miigwech, for having me. And thanks, everybody, for taking time. Again, we all sit in front of screens all day. And just uh, it's very humbling to have you know, this larger group and the, the positive feedback. And just don't be afraid to engage in the work. It's this really important work. It's, it's human rights. It's civil rights. It's humanity. Um, it's, it's beyond a federal law. You know, this is what, what you do as people, I think. And so it's nothing, nothing like it. Once you do even one, it really, really changes you. It's really a powerful thing. So um, just don't, don't be hesitant. Don't be afraid, you know, just take your baby steps, but um, take those steps. Exactly. Well, thank you again. Thank you to IMLS for funding this program and FAIC as always. Thank you to Learning Times for producing this. Um, we'll be back at the end of March with another webinar. We're almost ready to launch it. It will be on our website soon. Also keep an eye out for our April and May programming. Uh, we hope everyone stays safe. And this recording will be posted on the, our, the AIC YouTube channel uh, probably within a couple of days and on our website. So thanks everyone, stay safe, and we'll talk to you soon.